يقول راجع عفو رب سامعي محمد بن الجزاري الشافعي الحمد لله وصلى الله على نبيه ومصطفاه محمد وآله وصحبه ومقرئ القرآن مع محبه وبعد إن هذه مقدمة فيما على قارئه أن يعلمه إذ واجب عليهم محتم قبل الشروع أولا أن يعلموا ما خارج الحروف والصفات ليلفظوا بأفصاح اللغات محرر التجويد والمواقف وما الذي رسم في المصاحف الحمد لله رب العالمين وأطلب الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا يا أرحم الراحمين تمام جزاك الله خير Oh Allah teach us what benefit us, increase us in knowledge and good morals and in good deeds, Ya Arham ar So we continue by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings in Manzumat al-Muqaddima fi ma yajibu ala qari al-Qur'an al yalamah min nabi imam al-Huffar wa hujjat al-Qurra Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Yusuf ibn al-Jazari rahimahullah ta'ala Al-Mawlud Sanat 751 Wa al-Mutawaffa سنة ثمانمائة وثلاث وثلاثين. He was born seven hundred fifty one and passed away eight hundred thirty three. رحمة الله تعالى. And we are still in the section of تجويد, which is باب التجويد or section four. What does he say? رحمة الله والأخذ بالتجويد حتم لازم من لم يصحح القرآن آثم لأنه به الإله أنزل وهكذا منه إلينا وصل وهو أيضا حلية التلاوة وزينة الأداء والقراءة. وهو إعطاء الحروف حقها من كل صفة ومستحقها ورد كل واحد لأصله واللفظ في نظيره كمثله مكملا من غير ما تكلف باللطف في النطق بلا تعسف وليس بينه وبين تركه إلا رياضة بإن بفكه So these four sections المقدمة and مخارج الحروف and صفات الحروف and this section of تجويد are the most important in the whole poem in the whole poem these are the most important, particularly maharij and maharij al sifat. So you have to learn them very well and master them very well. Before we talk about idram and ibhar and and qalb and ikhfa, before we talk about these ones, you have to know maharij very well and sifat very well. And for you as as a hafid and as as an ijaza seeker. You have to know very well the history of the Qur'an, how this Qur'an reached us, and why do we have to learn Tajweed? And what is the ruling of learning Tajweed? Though these ex extremely important topics have to be known by every Qur'an student. We stopped at the line, لِأَنَّهُ which is line 28, لِأَنَّهُ بِهِ الْإِلَاهُ أَنْزَلَ وَهَكَذَا مِنْهُ, منه, وهكذا منه إِلَيْنَا وَصَلَ we said لِأَنَّهُ means because the matter is that with it means with what? With it means with what? Tajweed. With Tajweed. With it, Bihi. Al-Ilahu, the God, the Ilah, Anzala, revealed. And we said this Alif is for what? It's not Alif of the dual, it's Alif of the Itlaq. Right? So he just released the Fatha to keep the rhythm. So, bihi ilahu anzala. Because why it is mandatory to learn tajweed? Why it is, is it mandatory to correct your pronunciation and your recitation of the Quran in a way that you don't make mistakes that change the meaning? Why? Because this is because with tajweed and with this way Allah revealed it. Wahakada and thus and in this way, وَهَكَذَا مِنْهُ إِلَيْنَا وَصَلَ And this is how it reached us from Him, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. This is how it reached us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we were talking, we talked how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the Holy Qur'an and how he was very eager to uh, get it right away and memorize it and not forget it, right? Then we mention some of the of the proofs 
about the, the Quran and how it is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we started talking about the transmission of the Holy Quran. And we said we have two types of transmission. Right, Yashi? Two types. These are your slides, huh? We have two types of transmission of the Quran. So, so far, we still review. But you can start from here. We have how many types of transmission of the Quran? Two. What are those two? Written and oral, right? We have written transmission and oral transmission. Which is the most, which one is the most important? Which, which one is the main one? Huh? Which one is the main one? The oral or the written? Or. The oral. The oral transmission is the main, is the main authority for us. Now, in recent years, some in one of the British universities, they said they found, uh, they discovered some manuscripts of the Quran that goes back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ or the time of Sahaba. We say it doesn't really change anything for us. It doesn't change anything because the Quran is preserved orally by millions and millions of, of Muslims. And it was transmitted to them by huge number of people who got it from huge number of people who got it from huge number of people from Sahaba from the Prophet So there is no room logically for any mistake. Right? So now if they come and say, ah, oh, but there are some differences. We say, we don't trust you. We don't trust your words. We have the oral transmission is the main authority. And yet, in addition to that, we have, we have the sciences that enable us to write a copy just like the one that was written in the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you will mention this. So we said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he receives some ayat, what will he do? What will he do? He will call on the scribes, right? The writers, those who used to know how to read and write. They will write those ayat. Then what will they do? They will go out to people. Of course, we talked about the, how much the Prophet ﷺ encouraged Sahaba, right? How much he encouraged Sahaba and urged them to memorize. And we said, we mentioned many ayat and hadith to show how much encouragement the Muslims received from the Prophet ﷺ. And that made them very eager to learn and memorize the Quran. And we said that is a main reason to help to, that made Muslims memorize, especially here in the U.S. For example, here in the U.S., the, you guys you memorize the Quran, but you don't know the meanings. Why? Because your your parents urge you, and you, Alhamdulillah, inshallah, hopefully you also love to memorize because you knew how many, you knew how, how great the rewards are. You will get the crown of life, and the Quran will be with you in your grave, and when you come out of the grave, and will shade you in the, on the day of, of judgment, etc., etc. All these blessings, and this is why you memorize, even though you don't understand the meanings, right? And of course, you should try and learn to uh, understand the meanings as well. But this is just an example that shows you how the words of the Prophet ﷺ and the encouragement of the Prophet ﷺ uh, had a great impact in, on the lives of Muslims. So that was about the oral transmission. Then we talked about the written transmission and we said how Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he will ask Sahaba who write and they, he will call, call them on and they will write then what will he do? Like in the hadith we mentioned as you can see on the, on the screen this hadith one of the most important hadith in this regard where Sayyiduna Zayd radiallahu anhu as in this hadith narrated by Imam Tawarani he will say what? I used to write the wahi, the revelation, right? For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is dictating to me. And when I am done, uh, he will say, read. Read what you wrote. So I will read. فَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهِ سَقْطٌ أَقَامَهُ If there was any mistake, he will correct me. Then I will come out to people. Now we said he's coming out to people. Why? What will he do? Now people will start copying from his copies. 
Some people might not have been present when the Prophet ﷺ called those writers because they were not like employees, right? So he will call them and yeah, all of them are present. No. Whoever is available, they will come and write. And some people who were not present, then they start making copies. And I asked you a, a, a very important question. I said, what is the value or the difference between these copies that were written in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ and the copies that were made from those copies? What's the difference? Those copies that were written in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ are sacred copies, are holy copies. Why? Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ is present and he will correct them and, and he was proofreading, if you will, right? And the revelation is there, the angel of Wahy is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there, so he will, and this is the main copy, this is the reference, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will not allow any mistake therein. But later when someone makes a copy by himself, his, he is not a prophet, so he can make a mistake. And this is why we said, the main reliance is the oral transmission. And those Sahaba radiallahu anhum, uh, even though they had their own copies of the Quran later on, all those copies were burnt by Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhum, just as a precaution, so that no one will just adopt his own copy some of the Sahaba sometimes they will write commentary on the Quran, commentary on some ayat. They will add a word just to explain how they understood the ayah. So that no one will come later and think that that word or that commentary is part of the Quran. So this is what Sayyidina Uthman decided and all Sahaba agreed with him. And then they all made copies from the master copy, the original copy that was collected by Sayyidina Zayd anhu, and then uh, made also copied to other six other copies by Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu and so that's a question that I asked you and as we said those copies that were written in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam were made so many copies were made from them in addition to that at the same time at the same time the writers are more or those who memorize by heart are more? Those who memorize by heart, obviously. Because the Arabs were illiterate. They didn't know how to read or write, right? As the Prophet said, we are an, an illiterate ummah. We don't calculate and we don't read or write. Does he mean uh, then we should stay illiterate, we should not read, we should not calculate, we should not learn how to calculate, we should not learn how to read or write. Not at all. He was describing the situation there. This is why he told them, we are, we don't calculate, means we don't know calculation. So when you want to start the fast, just look at the, at the crescent. Right? But now the Ummah, they know. So we don't have to just wait until 1 a.m., to know is it Ramadan or not, or is it Eid or not, or etc. Right? That is the opinion, of course, of, of a great number of scholars in the past and the present. Right? Because the, the, the reason was that we don't know, we don't calculate and we don't write. It doesn't, he didn't say, he didn't mean we don't want to calculate, we know calculation, but we don't want to calculate. We know how. Well, if you say that, what about reading and writing? Did he mean we don't we know how to read and write, but we don't want to read or write? No, of course no. Anyway, so he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam urged the sahaba to write and to memorize, and the, those who were memorizing were much greater in number than those who who were writing. And as you mentioned, one of the female Sahabiyat, Um Hisham, until Harith radiallahu anha, she memorized the whole Surah Qaf just from the khutbah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And you know the Sahaba, everyone teaching his children, etc, etc. Look, for me, by Allah's blessings, yeah, my, my children, kindergarten and, and first grade. Kindergarten, she memorized one part out of 30 parts of the Quran. The other one, she memorized two parts. Two parts out of 30, and she's first grader. So what about those great ones? Even though she doesn't know that Arabic very well like them. For them, the Qur'an is their language. For us, 
the language of the Quran is not exactly the language we speak in our uh, Arabic dialects. There are some words that we don't know. We need to check the dictionary for. But for them, that was their direct language. So they memorized. They memorized. And we said that the main, the main means, the main means or the main medium for, for learning was what for them? For them is memorization. It was memorization because illiteracy was spread in their community, and because they they were very good in their what in their uh, literature. They were excellent in memorizing poetry, right? They used to have competitions and festivals of, of what? <coughs> they had what festivals in, in what? In poetry competition. Every tribe has its own poet and the people of the tribe will memorize those thousands of, of verses of poetry. Right? So that was the special qualities of the Arabs that enabled them to memorize the Quran and help them to memorize the Quran really well. And also from the proofs of that, that on the day of Ma'una, that's I think where we stopped last time, right? What was the last thing you, the last point you wrote? Isn't it about Qunut? Huh? Was it about Qunut? No. What was it? Yeah, about the hadith where those 70 Qurra were killed, isn't it? What was the last thing you wrote? Were you here? What was it? I, I didn't have the chance to check the video exactly, see where we stopped. Huh? We were about to start the copying. Huh? The copying? But we did talk about that. Because... We talked about that? But did we explain the whole hadith? We didn't. So, we said on the day of Ma'una itself, 70 of the Qur'an, the teachers of the Qur'an were killed by the pagans. Imam Muslim narrated in his Sahih that, from Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu, that some people came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said to him, they were not Muslims, they said, Ibat ma'ana rijalan ma'alimuna Qur'an wa sallam, send some men with us so that they teach us the Qur'an and sunnah. So he sent them 70, 70 of the Ansar, of the supporters of the Prophet ﷺ, of the people of Medina, to which he migrated ﷺ. They used to be called Al-Qurra, the reciters. Means they memorized the Qur'an. They taught the Qur'an. فيهم خالي حرام. Among them was my uncle. يقرؤون القرآن they used to recite the Qur'an and study it among themselves at night and teach it to others. And in the more, in the, during the day, they will go and get water. You know, they used to go to the wells and get water, right? They didn't have the taps. And they will put the water in the masjid. And they used to go and, and uh, get some wood, right? And come and sell it and buy some food for the poor people and for the people of as -Suffa. People of as they were some poor Sahaba companions of the Prophet. They used to live around the masjid of the Prophet and used to be very ascetic, very, very uh, humble, very knowledgeable. And uh, those are themselves the Qurra. And they used to, to have great knowledge about the Qur'an. So the Prophet ﷺ sent those people to, to those pagans to teach them. And then they made like a, a trap for them and they killed them even before they reached their place. And those Sahaba, they said, Oh Allah, inform your Prophet about what happened to us. Inform him that we have met you and that we are pleased with you and that you are pleased with us. 
And then he said, a man came and met the uncle of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu, and he stabbed him in his back. And then Haram said, the uncle of Sayyidina Anas, he said, Fuzdu wa Rabbi al-Ka'ba. Allah Akbar. The man stabbed him on his back. And when he stabbed him and the, 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 the spear, right? Spear? The spear. The spear, spear. the spear came out from his, from his belly, from his back and came, penetrated his body. What did he say? He says, I won, I have won by the Lord of the Kaaba. Fuzdu wa Rabbi al-Kaaba. Because once he died, and as a shaheed, he will see right away his place in Jannah. Right? He saw right away his place in Jannah. So he said, I have won. I have won. Allah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him by the revelation. And he said, your brothers have been killed. And this is what they said. They said, oh Allah, inform our prophet that we have met you and you are pleased with us and you are, and we are pleased with you. So, in another narration, when Sayyiduna Anas was asked about qunut in salah, as I told you, he said, Sayyiduna Anas, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made qunut one whole month after Rukur. One whole month he made qunut, which is the dua, like the one we do in winter. He said, he sent some people called al qurra 70 men. They were killed, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made qunut one whole month in all salawat, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, in all salawat. Praying against those pagans who killed his companions, the Qurra. See the importance of those great people. This qunut is called qunut al-nazila, qunut of the disaster. When a disaster or calamity afflicts the Muslims, it is Sunnah in the four schools, Shami, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, with some little differences that you make dua in salawat, in every salah. Some of them they say Fajr and Isha only. So you make dua after ruku in every salah to pray for the Muslims so that Allah lift the calamity or the disaster. How did that start? Because of the Qur'an. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was very, very sad as Imam Bukhari narrates from Sayyidina Anas himself عنه, that I didn't see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam feeling sad for something as he felt sad for them. He never felt sad for something and felt pain for something as he felt for those Qurra because they, those are like a treasure for the Ummah. Those are the, the teachers of the Qur'an. See the importance of the teachers of the Qur'an, of the Qurra. A dua was legislated for them. A dua was started in Salah because of them, for them, for their right to pray against those who killed them and violated their right. So this, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that happened. This shows you what? Only an example, how many of the Sahaba memorized the Qur'an and learned the Qur'an. And here we're talking about the whole Qur'an. Let alone, let alone that every surah of the Qur'an was memorized by a huge number of Sahaba. Huge number. Just like now, let's say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ How many people in the world memorize قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allahu Samad. Or just Amma, let's say. Hundreds of millions, right? Hundreds of millions. In every generation of the Muslim community, there's a huge number that know certain chapters of the Qur'an. And there's also a huge number that knows the entire Qur'an. So this is how this transmission, this is called Tawatur. You remember when we learned the definition of the Qur'an, you have to know this very well. This is Tawatur. How can all of them make a mistake and no one corrects the other? How come that let's, uh, they sit and they fabricate something or they add something or they drop something? It's impossible, logically, reasonably, rationally, scientifically impossible. This is why I asked many of the, of the brothers and the friends in, in Georgia, how, do you, 
I, I challenge one of them, just memorize this, just this page of the Bible for me. Just memorize this page, but you have to literally memorize it. No one, they, they fail. No one can, could do that. No one could do it. I said, tell me one person in the whole world who knows the Bible by heart. In any language you choose. No one. But I told them, our kids know the entire Quran by heart, letter by letter. Is not that a miracle by itself? It is. Now, in another, in another incident, after the passing away of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know that the, some of the Arab tribes, they apostatized. What did they do? They rebelled against the Muslim state of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They rebelled. They were trying to finish off the state of Islam. Some of them claimed to be a prophet. Some of them stopped giving zakat to the Muslim state. So they made like, what do they call it here? Like rebellion, right? They made a rebellion. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr anhu. He took one of the greatest positions in history of Islam that saved Islam. They say this is the very the first and most important position that someone took to save Islam. If he did not fight those rebels, Islam would have finished. Islam would have finished. And he even though the Prophet ﷺ, right before his death, he prepared an army to go to the borders of Syria because the Romans, they were threatening the Muslim state. So he sent an army and led by Sayyidina Zayd, if you remember, Usama bin Zayd. And he passed away ﷺ before the army went. And now, imagine the Romans are just waiting for any chance to finish off the Muslim woman. And those tribes, those Arab tribes, they were they had some hypocrisy, some of them. So once the Prophet ﷺ died, what happened? The Romans, they want to make, to take use of the chance of having no leader. When there's no leader in a, in a country, that's the best time to, to attack that country, right? When there's chaos, right? Sayyidina Abu Bakr that amazing, great, greatest Sahabi ever, according to Ahl Sunnah scholars of Ahl Sunnah. He, what did he do? He sent the army of Sayyiduna Osama. Even though, even though those, those Arab tribes rebelled, he also prepared an army and he by himself went and sent to also fight those rebels. In this way, even the Romans themselves, they were they, they quit their plans because they said this state is, is, a, is, a, is a great state even though their leader died still they're having they're ready to, to defend themselves so Sayyidina Abu Bakr took a great great position عنه, and saved Islam by Allah's blessings and Allah's help he saved Islam in that courageous position we know Sayyidina Omar is the courageous man and, and he's a strong but we forget that, that Sayyidina Abu Bakr, also a great, great, courageous man who took the greatest position to save Islam and Muslims. In those battles, one of them called Al-Yamama, the day of Yamama or the battle of Yamama, another 70, 70 of the Qurra were killed. Another 70 of the Qurra were killed. What did Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu do. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, this great muhaddath, this great sahabi who, who, whose opinions came in harmony with the Quran in many occasions before it was revealed. Like he would suggest something, he would suggest something, and the Quran will come in accordance 
with his suggestion many times. That's called muhadda or wulha. He got a type of inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tawfiq and success and his like he's far sighted, right? He came to Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu and he said the killing has to break among the Qurra of the Quran, the teachers of the Quran on the day of Yamama. And I am afraid. Look now. Because the main trial the main reliance in the transmission of the Quran is what? Is the oral transmission. We're not afraid about the, the written copies. Even that written copy was not even compiled. That is not our main concern. Our main concern was what? Those who are orally transmitting the Quran. And this is why he told him, the killing is, has spread among the teachers of the Quran in many places. And I'm afraid that some of the Quran will get lost. Some of the Quran will get lost. And this is why he said, I, I see that he should command that we compile the Quran. What did he say, huh? We, I, I, he's coming to suggest to that leader, to the Amir, to the President of the state. He's saying, I think you should command that we compile the Quran. At that moment, where was the Quran? Was the Quran written? At that moment, was it written? Yes or no? Was it written? Yeah. Was it written? Written. Of course, the entire Quran was written. And more than one copy, more than one copy, many copies in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we explained that in details. But, was there one copy that is compiled in one place? No. Those copies were? distributed among the Sahaba and the scribes. So I wrote this copy, it's like mine, but this copy is sacred. Why? Like let's say I was a writer, a scribe in the time of the Prophet وسلم, and he was and he was and he was. So when I go and write this piece of verses that includes some verses, I have it, I keep it with me, right? But the value of this piece is, 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 is very great. It's a sacred and holy parchment or piece of writing. Why? Because it was approved by who? By the Prophet and of course by the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But if I, someone, my friend, he came and made a copy from my copy, doesn't mean his copy is, is, is sacred or holy. This is why if you understand this, you will understand what Sayyidina Zayd did. You will understand what Sayyidina Zayd did and what he asked for. And what why he asked for two witnesses? For what? He asked two witnesses for what? Let's see. Now Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu, that was his suggestion. Again, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu, his amazing foresight and intelligence, that was his suggestion. Then Sayyiduna Abu Bakr said, how can we do something that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do? Is this a religious matter or just a worldly matter? What do you think? Hmm? Is this a religious matter? A matter that is related to our religion and to the core of our religion which is the Quran or just a worldly matter? Were they discussing a religious matter or a worldly matter? Mm -hmm. huh? Religious. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, just like all the Sahaba, they were very keen on, right? They were very keen and eager on or eager to Follow every step of the Prophet ﷺ. Follow the Prophet ﷺ in every step. Right? Following the Sunnah and the way of the Prophet. Why? Because he's the greatest person. He's, he's supported by revelation from Allah. And this is why Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, How, how can we do something Rasulullah ﷺ did not do? And here comes now in this day and age, the argument of many Muslims. When we do something that Rasulullah didn't do, they come and say, but Rasulullah did not do this thing. But doesn't mean, does, it, does that mean it is haram? Well, if it is haram, then we'll listen to Sayyidina Umar. What did he say? Sayyidina Umar said, but by Allah, this is something good. Uh, 
by Allah this is something good so here we can learn just from this simple discussion among these two great greatest companions of the Prophet not everything Rasulullah sallallahu did sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do is wrong to do that's a, an invalid argument that is not right and the proof is Sayyidina Abu Bakr approved with him later approved with him that means what Sayyidina Abu Bakr meant and what the scholars mean something in something that the Prophet ﷺ specified. He told us, Dhuhr is four rak'at, you cannot come and change it. He did not do Dhuhr six, so you cannot do it six. This is an extremely important point. Because so many scholars now, they come as, as students of knowledge and even normal people, they come and ask, this is bid'ah, the Prophet didn't do this, so it's bid'ah, so it will lead you to the hellfire. And this is bid'ah, and this is bid'ah, and that's bid'ah. Why? The Prophet didn't do it. So we have to understand this argument. It is an innovation that is rejected. If the Prophet specify something, then you come and you want to change it. He specified Dhuhr for Rak'at. He specified the Salawat or five, the obligatory Salawat, etc. etc. He specified after Salawat you make 33 Subhanallah, 33 Alhamdulillah, etc. Or in another narration, 10 times Subhanallah, like when you're in a hurry, for example, let's say. Don't start making like 10, 10, 10. You say, Abdullah said that you can only make 10 and it's with 33. You can make that in like sometimes when you're in a hurry, let's say. So, Sayyidina Omar he told him this is something good. So now, when we make a, just a completion ceremony for Quran students, they memorize some parts of the Quran, we make a celebration, we bring some food, we make some nasheed, we give a reminder. That's something Rasulullah did not do. Sahaba did not do. The students of Sahaba did not do. And this is a religious matter or no? Huh? It's a religious matter or no? It is a religious matter. So if you come and tell me, ah, this is bid'ah, okay, then why, how are you doing it? Same thing celebrating the birth of the Prophet Same thing uh, dua when you complete the khatim of Quran in Taraweeh. The Prophet did not do. Sahaba did not do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alihi wa sahbihi. You get the idea? So those people who come with everything that Rasulullah did not do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and come and say bid'ah, 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 they are themselves drowned in many bid'ahs. So their bid'ah is not bid'ah, but our bid'ah is bid'ah. That is, these are the words of people who don't have foundation in knowledge. You understand? The bid'ah is something that you start in the religion which contradicts any of the foundations or any of the traditions in the Quran or the Sunnah. That is the bid'ah. But anything that, that we start, any practice that we start in the religion that does not contradict the Quran or the Sunnah, that is not a bid'ah. The one that contradicts the Quran or Sunnah, that is the bid'ah that is rejected. The one that changes what the Prophet ﷺ specified, that is the bid'ah. Is that clear? The thing that changes a prescribed ibadah, that is the bid'ah. If you change a prescribed ibadah, or if you claim or start an ibadah and you claim that it is prescribed. I'll give you an example. Celebrating the birth of the Prophet ﷺ is an activity, is a da'wah activity where you make use of the event or the time of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ to remind people about his life and to give food and etc. etc. That's an amazing thing. That is all full of good. But if you claim that this is a prescribed ibadah that Allah prescribed or the Prophet prescribed that we have to celebrate his birth, then that is bid'ah. Do you understand the, the difference? Same thing, if we want to make a juzah completion or khatim completion, khatim ceremony and we celebrate and make dua and, and make nasheed and give food that is very good, very nice but if you claim, huh? if you claim that this is a ibadah that we have to do this thing then that is a bit. Do you understand the difference? Okay so Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, and this is the vast majority of the Muslim scholars, 
And this is why they said there are some bid'ahs that are mandatory. It's mandatory. For example, learning the science of Tajweed, the theoretical of rules, Idhar, Idhar, Iqlab, it's mandatory, communal obligation to learn these rules and teach them so that the Quran is preserved in its pronunciation and in, in its words, even though this was not in the time of the Prophet Sahaba did not know something called Idram and Idhar and Qalb and Ikhfa, etc. Even though they used to apply them, but theoretically did not, did not even have those names for those rules. Right? Same thing with the Arabic grammar, same thing with so many other things. So Sayyiduna Umar said, this is something good. Well, is there anything in the Quran or Sunnah that prevented the Muslims from combining the Quran? No. Is this thing that Sayyiduna Umar is suggesting, is it something that will achieve some interest and benefit for the Muslims? Of course. Then, Bismillah is not with that. It's good. See what Sayyidina Umar said? It's good. So, Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, Umar continued discussing with me until Allah sharaha sadri lidharik. Until Allah opened my heart for that. And now I have the opinion that Umar has. Who's talking to who? Sayyidina Abu Bakr talking to who? To Sayyidina Zayd, the master of the compilation of the Quran. Now Sayyidina Zayd said, Sayyidina Zayd said that Sayyidina Abu Bakr said to him. So now Sayyidina Zayd came and Sayyidina Abu Bakr told him, Omar came to me and told me this, this, this. So we had a discussion until Allah opened my heart. So now I think, yes, we should do like Omar suggested. You should do what? Compile. Compile the Quran. Why? Because our main reliance is on the oral transmission, on the Quran, on the reciters, on the teachers. And now a huge number of them is being killed. So we're afraid if a huge number is killed, now we're afraid that some of the Quran will not be transmitted, huh? Will not be transmitted as before, will not be taught as before because we are losing the teachers. So let's catch up before. So what is the solution? We cannot now make copies of those Qurra before they die. We cannot make a copy of the Habit in a quick way, but we can make, compile the main copy, and then people can learn from that copy. Through the help of the remaining Hafad and Qurra and teachers. Did you get the point? So Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, to Sayyidina Zayd, You are a young man, and a wise man, a mindful person, and we never, look, we never, we never doubt your trustworthiness and honesty. And you used to write the revelation to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please go and compile the Quran and follow and get every parchment and compile it in one copy. So he said, by Allah, if they asked me to move a mountain from its place, it wouldn't have been heavier and more difficult than what they commanded me to do. SubhanAllah. This was his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his fear of the responsibility and, and the, the sacredness of this act, of this task. You're gonna compile Allah's words. You're gonna go every ayah, every pieces of verses. You have to get all those parchments, all those pieces of leather, all those uh, bone uh, shoulder blades, all those stone tablets, all those uh, big leaves of trees in which the Qur'an was written, imagine, imagine, imagine how, how many pieces he has to compile. It's a huge task. How he's going to compile them? He already memorizes the Qur'an. And many, many Sahaba still memorize the Qur'an, right? Seventy doesn't mean they were only seventy. No. And here's some, some some people who, who attack Islam, they say, ah, oh, they were 70, this means now when they're combining the Quran, they were in doubt. 
How they were in doubt? Who told you they were only 70? When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, there were 100,000 Muslims in Hajj. 100,000. When he entered Mecca, there, was, there were 10,000. Those are only the fighters, 10,000. Let alone the children and the women who, who all memorized huge or full amounts of the Quran. Full, the full Quran were huge amounts of it. So Sayyiduna Zayd radiallahu anhu, he felt that responsibility of this task, the, the, the greatness of this task, the, sacred, the, the sacredness of this task. So he said, but how? How do you do something Rasulullah did not do? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, then Sayyidina Abu Bakr said to him the same argument of Sayyidina Abu He said, but by Allah it is something good. So he said, Abu Bakr continued discussing with me until Allah opened my heart to what he opened the heart of Abu Bakr and Umar for. Sharah Allah Sadri, Lilladi Sharah Adabu, Sadra Abi Bakr wa Umar. Subhanallah. So he said, فَتَتَبَّعْتُ Quran." So I started tracing, going, searching. He stopped as in the other hadith with Sayyidina Umar at the door of the masjid and he started calling any person who has anything written in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa of the Quran, let him bring it. And let him bring, huh? Now the, the important points you have to open your minds well. And let him bring two witnesses. Two witnesses. Who can tell me witnesses for what? They saw him. That they saw him in the presence of the Excellent. He stood at the door of the masjid and started calling the Muslims. Anyone who has anything that was written in the Prophet presence, bring it. And you should have two witnesses that two witnesses that this piece of the Quran was written in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because those pieces were what's the value of those pieces? Sacred and holy pieces. And this is why we need two witnesses that you were there. Even though we trust you, but we want another witness. So he said, back to Quran. I started compiling the Quran. Getting the Quran from those leaves of trees from those stone tablets, from those shoulder, shoulder blades. And the Sahaba are with him. He's not doing it by himself. He's like the head of the committee. He's like the head of that committee. Then he said, I started combining, combining. So when he's combining, does he know what he's combining? Does he memorize what is there? Of course. Only him? No. Sayyidina Umar knew the Quran. Sayyidina Abu Bakr knew the Quran. Sayyidina Uthman knew the Quran. Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Ubay, Sayyidina Abu All of those great Sahaba knew the Quran very well. And, and look now what he said. But I missed an ayah. I missed some ayat from Surah Al Tawbah and Surah Al Ahzab. I couldn't find them except with one person. Abu Huzayma ibn Thabit al Asari. What did he miss? What did he miss? What did he miss? The second last ayat. Two, two ayat from Surah Al Tawbah and some ayat from an ayat from Surah Bat al Ahzab. What did he miss? Like he forgot the ayat. What is he talking about? Guys, this is a very important question. What did he forget? But what did he miss? What is the thing that he didn't find? What is it? He compiled the whole Quran. What did he compile? He compiled the parchments that were written in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What did he miss? Answer. What did he miss? He missed the parchments that include those ayat. Understand? How did he know? Because he knows the surah. He was collecting, compiling surah at Tawbah, and he he was putting uh, the ayat. Right? 
نظر بعضهم what's the beginning of the ayah وإذا ما أنزل سورة right نظر بعضهم إلى بعض هل يراكم من أحد ثم صرفوا صرف الله قلوبهم بأنهم قوم لا يفقهون then what do we have after that لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسهم he knows that so he couldn't find it the main reliance is what the oral transmission and of course he's not working by himself only he's the head of the committee so he missed what the written parchment of those ayah well does that mean no one except for Sayyidina Abu Khuzayma bin Thabit had that parchment of course not some sahaba also wrote it but he wanted only and exclusively the parchments that were written were in the presence of the, of, in the, of the Prophet but he made a rule he wanted that what how many witnesses should be there for every parchment two witnesses now he couldn't find except for one person and he is by himself he doesn't have a witness who was that? Sayyidina Abu Khuzayma ibn Thabit or Khuzayma ibn Thabit al Ansari radiallahu anhu. He said, I couldn't find it with someone else. What does that mean? Means many parchments he found them with more than one person. Or there were more than one witness. There were two witnesses minimum. Imam Bukhari here closes the hadith. He says, Then those scrolls, can we say scrolls? pieces, separate pieces, they were not in one, but just separate pieces, they were with Abu Bakr until he passed away, then with Omar, all of his life, then Hafsa, the daughter of Omar, the wife of Rasulullah kept them in her chamber. That was the end of Hadith al-Bukhari. Now, what did Sayyidina Zayd do? He got focused with me, many, many, I searched this topic, I'm not exaggerating, if I spent at least five zero hours, 50 hours at least during these couple of years since I, I give, gave this series in, in Raleigh. And you can also watch those, uh, these same with maybe some details at that time in, in the Quranic talk series in, in my channel. Uh, Sayyiduna Zayd radiallahu anhu, what did he do exactly? He got those parchments. And he now, what did he do? He copied them, huh? Did not only compile them, huh? He copied them into organized, same size, almost pieces of some scholars, they say the deer skin. Because the deer skin is very strong, very good. So this is what some scholars say. So he, the, the point is he organized them in similar scrolls or pieces of leather and instead of having them in some verses on shoulder, shoulder blades some verses on, on stone tablets some verses on, on leaves of trees no, he got now combined them and he had them wired on scrolls of, of animal uh, skin so now we have like a book but it's not like connected with like a thread or stable together, right? But now we have all of them in one place and all of them organized like scrolls. That's what he did. But still we have a problem here. What was the problem? That this, these ayat from Surah Tawbah and Surah Ahzab, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَهْدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْكَ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى رَحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَضِي وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَرْدِيلًا Right? Those ayat, he didn't find them, except with he didn't find them, the, the written copy, except for who? Except with who? With Sayyidina Abu Khuzayma ibn Thabit. And his name also is Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari. Radiyallahu anhu wa arda. So as you mentioned, after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, as you can see on the screen, please look at this screen, exactly describes what I mentioned, Ya Shaykh. Look at these different parchments, different tools of writing. Look here, for example, these are shoulder blade, like bone, right? Look here, like stone tablet, leaves. What did Satan Zayd do? Look, these parchments that are equal, similar in size, this is what he did. This is what he did. 
He puts all of them, copied those into these pieces, and now we have this copy of the whole Quran. It's almost like a book. Did you get it? Now, what did Sayyidina Zayd do? We have a problem here. We don't have, the problem is not that, uh, like, these verses are some, some ignorant people who did not study, who did not learn, who did not read the old hadith. They think, ah, oh, those ayat were only new, were only known by Zayd. <laughs> we're not talking about Hafid here. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Are we talking about Hafid or the written copy? Here we're talking about the written copies that were written in the presence of the Prophet This is why he wanted two witnesses that this copy was written in the Prophet's presence. These ayat. Everything else he found two witnesses. Now, do you have a miracle here? Even, let's suppose, just suppose, he did not even find that written parchment. What will he do? He'll just come and write it. He will come and write it the same way they write, the Arabs write those ayat. Because he knows it, and so other Sahaba knows it. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them that there was a miracle here. Even the way the letters were written, it was preserved. This Sahabi, Sayyidina Khuzayma bin Thabit, there are authentic ahadith that if any person has Khuzayma bin Thabit as a witness, his testimony is enough. He doesn't need another person. Who said that? The Prophet ﷺ himself said that. So he, that, we don't need another witness. Again, this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Khuzayma bin Thabit anhu gives a testimony on something, on something, he doesn't need another witness. His testimony by himself is enough. Who said that? Is it Sayyidina Zayd? No, it's the Prophet ﷺ who said that. Why he said that? That's what we're going to mention next time, inshallah. Because there's a story, and there's a miracle, and there's a privilege for this great Sahaba Sayyidina Khuzayma that made his testimony equals two. His testimony is enough. He doesn't need another person to testify. Again, this story in itself is a miracle of the Quran. It's a miracle that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we mentioned, even suppose we don't have except for that, that parchment, even if we do not have the Qur'an written in the Prophet's time, it will not change the preservation of the Qur'an because the main reliance again is what? The oral transmission. And this is how Sayyidina Zayd knew. How did he know that there are some ayat missing? How did he know that there, these ayat are not written? I don't see these ayat when he was combining because he knows them and the Sahaba knows them, know them. Did you get the point? صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله من يسر دوز ويسن تسبيح الخلق تسبس الحمد لله رب العالمين. so we start from that point إن شاء الله بعد سيدنا خزيمة بن ثابت رضي الله عنه and why رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم by revelation from Allah he made his testimony enough he made his testimony suffices any matter and that he doesn't need another witness with him إن شاء الله Thank you.